snake. Oh, no, Billy. I'm your hairy little teddy bear. Remember me? Welcome to episode 16 of the Colombo podcast, where this week we have been trying to work out which of us is the slimy snake and who is the hairy little teddy bear. I think you're slimier than I am, Jerry. And you're hairier than I? I, I think that's indisputable. You think so? Yeah. I'm going to dispute that. <laughs> Not necessarily the hairiness, but the, <laughs> the slimy snakery part. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Have you been a... Uh, Catching up on your beauty routine this weekend, have you? I have. I'm a big fan of the the cosmetics industry generally. Really? Um, well, I'm aware it exists. What's your What's your daily routine? I have a face wash that I use in the shower. A face wash. Yeah, but I rub it my hands, wipe it my face. No, I don't have a sponge. I just use my hands. Okay, I won't discuss mine. It's much. It's like the guy in American Psycho, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> your Christian Bale every it's morning. Not, it's not. It's not too far off that. To be, to be fair. What's been happening this week, Ian? Uh, anything exciting? Have a, have a good one? Yeah, not been a bad week at all. Um, nothing dramatic been happening, but it's been that's always enjoyable. Good. Yes, that's what we like. Lack of drama. These When you get to our age now, Ian, lack of drama is a good week. That's it. I mean, especially, you, you know, you're approaching 40 now and you, um, want, to be, <laughs> you want to be relaxing more. I'm not approaching 40. <laughs> We're all approaching 40. <laughs> Technically. Uh, this week, Ian, we have Lovely But Lethal. We have. Season 3. Yes, we're breaking through into new ground. We are. Season 3 has been heralded. You've noticed on the blog and I've mentioned it myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited. Folk have been talking about this a lot. Yeah, what I would say is that without wanting to let anyone down or let yourself down before we discuss this episode, it probably starts with the weakest of, of Season 3. So don't let this one cloud your opinion. I'll do my best. But I have been promised that this is where the real Columbo begins. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to yeah, that. Yeah, I'd say the next yeah, two or three seasons really get to the the heart of Columbo. So I can forget everything I've learned and move on. Not everything. Okay, but there are bits and pieces. There are bits and pieces. Do you fancy giving us this week's summary? In- Lovely But Lethal sees Columbo introduced to the murky world of cosmetics development as a dispute over anti-wrinkle cream leads to a brutal murder. Vivica Scott, the face and head of Beauty Mark Inc., is shocked to learn that the formula she believed her chemists had produced does not work. When she learns that the true formula is about to be sold to a rival, dealing a potentially crippling blow to her business, she tries to make a personal intervention with Carl Lessing. As he rebuffs her advances, he signs his own death warrant. But can Columbo make the murder charge stick based only on a feeling? Thanks for that, Ian. I think we should make a rule at the start of this episode. There will be no wordplay around the, the beauty industry. I can't be bothered with uh, us discussing whether or not Columbo, anything's been concealed from him, or if he... If there's a foundation for his case. Yeah, except that's the type of stuff we're going to not do. Okay, I agree. We're not doing any of that? No. Okay. okay. That would make me blush. <laughs> we start in a... I thought, watching this again, it looked like a sort of medical theatre. Well, I thought it was a plastic surgeon mm. doing some sort of plastic surgery. That was my initial instinct. We see three doctor types leaning over a woman who is awake and looking fairly concerned. Yeah. There's a scalpel, and it's used to remove a, a scraping, a sample of skin from her face. That's right. And then we see a second woman, and it becomes apparent that, uh, especially due to a reference to Dr. Frankenstein, that there is some sort of experiment underway here. Yes. And there's a senior doctor. He's sweating and nervous, and he accidentally cuts one of the patients. Yeah, he seems to become really quite shaky, and he makes a mess of one of the incisions. The senior doctor, because of the condition that he's got himself into, gives way to the younger doctor and he yeah. takes over to finish it's this the little future procedure. President Bartlett. Apparently. We go into an office within the, the sort of theatre area where the older doctor retreats and he takes a large drink. He does a massive one. To help his trembling state. I'm sure that'll do a lot of good. 
That's what you need. I'm hoping that he wasn't doing that before he started the procedure. You just can't tell, though, because he does seem a little bit erratic. <laughs> and he declares that he's looking for a miracle. Well, the, there is a, there's a focus on this uh, a tub of cream. And he does say that, isn't it? It's a miracle. And he says it's all he's ever wanted. As he then looks at a, forlornly at a, a photo of a woman who he calls Majesty. Yeah, he certainly seems to be enamoured with her. And then there's a, a fade, a transition from this this photograph to the woman in question at a catwalk show. Yeah, we've seen that sort of transition in season one. The first time we saw it was in episode one, with yes, uh, Mrs was... Melville tran- uh, the transition to yeah. Ken Franklin but driving in the car. We saw it again in Dead Weight with mm-hmm. the portrait um, giving way to the actual person, which is more similar maybe to this. It's a nice technique. It's interesting. So we see this woman, and a man and his secretary arrive. And there's a little bit of verbal sparring between this man and the woman from the the, the, the portrait. Yeah, we get a couple of names here. We learn that she is Miss Scott and mm-hmm. he's Mr. Lang. He's David Lang. Yep. And this is Vivica Scott. Is it not? Unusual name, Vivica. Not unheard of, but certainly not heard very often. So this sparring that goes on between them, he hints that business may not be great for Vivica. It's made clear that there's a, a competition here between the two companies. He's they're his ri- own company. Yeah, they're rivals in the cosmetics industry. Yeah. And Vivica starts to patronise the secretary, apparently assuming that she is his partner. Right. But he confirms that she is his secretary, and so Vivica apologises as if to say, well, okay, fair play, you're, you're not in this game. Yeah. You do get the impression that it's kind of a cutthroat business as well, don't you? It's very much a a high stakes sort of situation going on here. I would they mention that throughout the episode. There's there's a discussion around that, and I would say that's pretty true to to real life. The cosmetics industry will be a multi billion dollar industry, yeah. and especially we we discuss later in the sort of anti aging field. Yeah, there's a massive amount of money. Especially if you can create a cream that makes wrinkles disappear instantaneously. Well, that would be remarkable. Vivica and David continue their conversation and he's quite condescending in his offer to buy her business should she wish to leave the market. But Vivica seems to surprise him by hinting at some new development. And then the secretary, now her name is Shirley, we discover. We learn that later on, yes. So Shirley appears and hands over a program that she claims Vivica had dropped. Yeah. But we know that's not true. No, no, it's not true at all. She's simply setting up a sort of scenario where she can supply information on one to the other. Mm -hmm. We go back to, or we go to the the Beauty Mark office. Now, Beauty Mark is the name of the company owned and and run by Vivica Scott. Yeah, I talked about that in in the summary. She's the face of the company, but she's also at the head of the company. It's mm-hmm. her company. And we see an employee presenting a marketing campaign to Vivica for a number of products, but one in particular, it's the aforementioned Miracle, which we discover is our wrinkle removing cream, and it's going to be worth yeah, millions in the 70s, billions by today's standards, I would have thought. Sure, it's going to make a big difference, and she's very excited, and she's got a big campaign set up to promote it. It's quite uh, quaint, isn't it, that they would call it Miracle? It just seems so... So blatant. There's no massive branding or any sort of subtle, uh, <laughs> subtle branding. They're just miracle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, because it's there's been a massive proliferation of these things in recent years. We're not really maybe quite as aware as we might have been about how this situation set up. If there isn't any cream of this type, mm-hmm. if this is a new first to market situation, that's a whole lot different from introducing a new one nowadays, where it would just be one of dozens and dozens that are sure, but available. I think, yeah, I think even today. I mean, what they've suggested has still not been developed. So this is not something that if you use it over time, it apparently will make you look at or, or slow down the aging process. This is a, a this is a miracle. This is you put this on your your skin and within seconds you look ten years younger. That hasn't and that's not been developed uh, to, to this day. So that type of new product to market would would revolutionise. It's also the interesting that she's in a stage of presenting it to market almost. Without it being any sort of independent clinical trials mm-hmm. or <laughs> testing being done. Yeah. 
we also find out that the company has little in the way of credit within perhaps with banks etc so they're, they're not doing very well at this point it's in time a, it's a tough moment for them it is so there's a you can understand there's a desperation for this product to be kept in-house to be kept secret for them to reap all the rewards that's right the whole company appears is will be relying upon the success or or, or failure of, of of this miracle product yeah this one big launch unfortunately however murchison arrives Yes, he's the guy we saw right at the start. Murchison is the, yes, the sweaty, nervous, older scientist or he, chemist. Yes, he's not calmed down at all. And he's got some bad news. We have a clip of that, that bad news. The fruits of a whole year's labour. My most sublime accomplishment. The dream of all mankind. The dream to save all our skins. <laughs> You're wobbling. Uh, yes, and I have hastened my queen from a final secret testing of this elixir. This masterpiece of my chemical genius. Who told you to do any more testing? What if one of your models talks? I thought my orders were quite clear. On the basis of last week's reports... Those reports were wrong. It was a fluke. I jumped the gun. One little sample that broke down. I tried combination after combination since this miracle of ours will never be any more useful for concealing wrinkles than axle grease. Bad news indeed. Terrible news, really. Axle grease. Yeah. To be honest, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. To that. I know what you're going to say. Oh no, I'm saying nothing. I'm not okay. going to comment on the cosmetics industry and the efficiency or effectiveness of their products. Of 99% of it being snake oil. No, I, I'm not no, saying that. Should. That would be a horrific misrepresentation of the industry. Yes, don't say that. It all works as described on the product. It's tested by scientists who wear white coats, yep. proving that they know what they're doing. Let's move on. Okay. We're at a restaurant, and it's... At first I wasn't sure... It said re, we saw the exterior... You know, declaring restaurant, yeah. and you get inside, and it looked like no restaurant I've ever been in. It looked like the like another sort of uh, beauty parlor or close. It's strange one. Maybe it's an industry specific restaurant. Either way, Vivica, she is there, and she's meeting with the with Shirley, the secretary. Yes, David she's, Lang's secretary. Yeah, she's turned um, infiltrator. Yes, perhaps she's an informant. Of, an informant. Yeah, maybe a little bit of personal ambition here. She maybe thinks she can. Uh, not, improve yeah. her position oh, without a doubt not just personal ambition from the way she talks in this scene and later scenes she despises David Lang we don't really find out why but she doesn't like him sure the info or the information she wants to pass is that that day Lang had produced or drawn a or drawn a check for $200,000 which is a lot more than that in today's money and this is to be given to a man, this is for a man called Harry Smith. Yeah, at first I assumed this must be Murchison, that's why he's so upset and he's so harassed. Mm -hmm. But it's not, and there's a description of the man and it rings a bell immediately with Vivica. Well, yeah, I mean, Vivica at first when she's given this news doesn't think anything of it. Yeah. Until the secretary tells, until Shirley tells her that, that Harry Smith isn't his real name. Yeah. And she says that, this was slightly confusing, she said that David Lang wanted to try and trick this Harry Smith. We never really we didn't really find out what that, that plot or that No, plan the plan was. doesn't really come to fruition. So it, it could have been left out. out. I don't think it would have required that. We that can line. only assume that he was trying to acquire this mm. formula without paying for it. Sure. And she explains that this this Harry Smith had a this wonder drug had this wrinkle repair uh, this wrinkle removing cream that's right so obviously at this stage vivica understands or starts to put together what has been going on here well yeah and she asks for this description and she realizes it is somebody who has been working at her company mm -hmm. it's not a harry smith it is in fact carl lessing yes he was a younger sort of doctor younger scientist the future president that we saw president. at the beginning of the episode yes so we move along to his home, or what appears to be his home. No, just built. We do, but just before then, there's a, okay. an important scene. It's back in the Beauty Mark office. Okay. 
we see a very angry Vivica on the phone and she's trying to get a hold of the company or her personal lawyer whose wife is telling her that she's he's not available at this point in time. She makes a lot of aborted phone calls in this episode. Mm-hmm. We're kind of starting a wee theme here. Yes. And we see her placing, she's got Carol Lessing's personnel file and we see her placing it back into the, the filing yeah. cabinet. Yeah, I didn't take any notes on that at the time mm-hmm. because it didn't seem important but it is later on. Yes. So as you say, we go to Lessing's home and we see him arrive in. And he has a drink, he relaxes a little bit and he peers through a, a microscope. Yep, he seems quite satisfied. Mm-hmm. He then hears a noise and realises that there are some drawers which have been opened and he gets slightly worried and he runs through to the kitchen. Why does he do that? He has something hidden away. He looks for this this, this item that's been hidden and yep. he's momentarily relieved to discover that it's still there. Yeah, it's in place, it's not a problem. However, Vivica appears from the, the shadows to confront him. Yep. We soon It soon becomes apparent that there's a pre-existing relationship between yes. the two of them. Do they call each other, or one of them call the other one lover or darling, something it's, like that? There's certainly an implication that it's a, a past relationship mm-hmm. as well, I think. And she explains the scenario to him, or her understanding of it. Sure. And at this point, Lessing doesn't try to deny it. No, I think he feels like he's in control of the situation, even though he's been surprised here mm-hmm. by her showing up. I think he knows what he wants to achieve, and I think he's quite confident. Yes. And he pours himself a, a tequila and cactus juice cocktail. Yes, a prickly concoction. Yes, which he said may have been an appropriate uh, drink for for Vivica. Yes, perhaps their relationship didn't end in the best of terms. <laughs> her personality may reflect <laughs> the drink. Vivica says that she's going to call the police, the yeah. chief of police. And she picks up the phone and this is, this is the thing. I think she dials his home number or directly through to his office. It's not an emergency call through the, the main switchboard, yeah. I don't think. But she does ask for him, so yes. it can't be him that answers the call. I think she's trying to call Lessing's bluff. Right. But Lessing, this is my view, but Lessing knows that it's a, uh, it's only a front because she cannot involve the police because then the information about this product would be would be out there. Right. So he's banking on the fact that he, that Vivica does not want anyone else to know about it, and, and it's true because when he she realizes that Lessing is not worried about this phone call, she hangs up. Yeah, and I think we can assume that she did not call the police at all, because otherwise it would come up mm-hmm. later on when the police are investigating what's going on. And it's at this point, yeah. I mean, it's at this point we hear the intro clip that we had at the start of the show, yeah. where she calls him a slimy little snake and. He just, you know, he at this point he doesn't care. Yeah, he, he brings out the charm, doesn't he? Mm. Well, <laughs> not sure how charming he is, but he's having fun. He is, he is. He's confident and he knows what's going on. And She wants to know where the formula is. She's been looking for it, obviously. Mm. We saw the empty drawers. Yes. But he tells her it's all in his head. Exactly. And he gives her the little jar of the prototype yep. that he found. Which makes me wonder... Why he'd be so anxious to find that when he thought the house had been broken into in the first place. If it's not a big deal, because he can manufacture more. Sure, but can he? Does he have the facility? Maybe he needs that to show that he has a formula that works. Mm, he'd have thought so otherwise, you've just got an idea in your head. Sure, but if you chat the door of David Lang or anyone else and say, listen, I've got this, uh, this drug which removes wrinkles immediately, then I'm sure the... It would be tricky, though, because as soon as he manufactures that in Lang's facility, Lang's got the formula. He doesn't need to give him money first. Yeah. It could have been. Maybe he just needs that as proof of concept. We should mention as well, we, mi- we missed in the last scene in the restaurant, where Shirley demonstrates the power of this. Yes, she does on a, an elderly lady. Yes, a maid. Uh-huh. It's quite a, it's quite a weird scene, isn't it? It's quite bizarre. The maid seems very thankful to have had one of her wrinkles fixed. <laughs> well, <laughs> piece of Cigarette ash removed from her face and it takes yeah. 10 minutes of rubbing. Anyway. Yeah, anyway, yeah. We find out, actually, back to Lessing, so this is where we find out his real name. Mm-hmm. It's Carl, because um, she addresses him in that way. And she assumes that he will sell this formula to the highest bidder. Mm-hmm. 
So she enters into some sort of early negotiations with him. She puts some figures down. He laughs at the initial attempt at remuneration. Yep. She comes back with more and he's still not happy. And then she asks what he wants and he seems to imply her. He wants the relationship back, yeah. And a relationship or a temporary restoration yeah. of the relationship. But either way, she seems, in her mind, that's a small price to pay. Either that or she's going to just pretend until such time as she has what she wants. Mm-hmm. And he's toying with her. He doesn't doesn't want her back. No, he, he implies that he wants to be her... In fact, he says he wants to be her partner in the business. Yeah. She he enjoy, at that. Yeah, he, means he enjoys demeaning her, I think, here. Well, the, the, Knowing that she's so desperate... And it sounds like the relationship she used people perhaps in the past. Well, you get the impression it's a flip of the previous relationship mm-hmm. that but they she had. The power, yeah. She was the power person mm-hmm. in the couple and maybe he feels like this is his yeah. opportunity to turn the tables a little bit. Yeah. And as you say, he then says that he wants to be a partner and she's immediately outraged but quickly realises that... There's no option. Exactly. So she agrees to that and now he flips and says, ah, nah. I only wanted to hear you say that. There's absolutely no chance. Yeah. I think he references Murchison yeah. and says that you know she, he won't be taken like a, a fool the way he as was. he was. And his reference to majesty, etc., so it appears that he really is infatuated by her yeah. and she and uses that. you wonder that. if she's treated him in a similar way when he mm. was younger and we kept him. Vivica is enraged by this. She is. And she picks up the microscope. Just the nearest thing that comes to hand, yeah. Smashes it over his head. Yeah, I'm not even sure that she's deliberately trying to kill him at this point. She's supposed to hit him hard with something, but it mm-hmm. does kill him. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, that is a good point. I don't think she tried to necessarily to kill him. She didn't set yeah. out that. Yeah, it's not like she's thinking, oh, the only thing I can do now is kill him. No. It's just like she's furious and she lashes out. Because, as we know, the formula is only in his head. As soon as he's dead, there's absolutely no chance. Well, of... Assuming he was telling the truth about that, yeah. Yeah. I'm quite confused, though, as to how we got to this point, because it seems like Murchison had a formula that worked at one point. Mm -hmm. So my assumption, then, is that Lessing has taken that formula at that point. He's falsified the data. And then corrupted things from there. So you would think that surely Murchison then has much of the work that he needs to recreate this situation. Yeah. In an untainted environment. Yeah, there's parts of that sort of plot which got a little bit clunky and became, I think it tried to become too intricate for its own good. Yeah, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment because there's a bit at the end of the next, not the next scene, the scene scene and a half away that I want to talk about that sort of point, so we'll come back to that. But yeah, there are points here where it doesn't quite go Mm -hmm. as smoothly as you'd like. So that's the end of Carol Lessing. So it's probably worthwhile just now just quickly talking about the actor who played them. Yeah, a well-known face. Doesn't need much of an introduction. Martin Sheen, born in 1940, father of Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen. Yep. Many Golden Globe and Emmy nominations for playing President Bartlett in The West Wing. Fantastic show. Also in films such as Apocalypse Now, The Departed, TV shows like Anger Management. So, yeah, we don't really need to say too much. He's got a glittering CV. He's also an activist and a mm-hmm. political person as well. Yes. He's dead. Or Carol well, Lessing's character's dead. dead, yes. Carol Lessing's so, dead. Yeah, and Vivica cleans up her mess to a certain extent, wipes off fingerprints, and then makes her exit with the formula. Yes. Not the formula so much as the product itself. Mm-hmm. And we see the Lessing's house exterior later on, I think the next morning. The next morning, I assume, yes. And this is Columbo's arrival. It is, his first appearance of season three, yep. so fans rejoice. They haven't seen him for a year. It's been six months. Okay, so this is a quick return. Yeah. Of course, we saw the previous season split in two over Mm -hmm. the festive period. Yeah. Just on that, while we're discussing it then, so it was 1973, 23rd of September, after a a six-month break, and it's the uh, 73-minute mark. Okay. This is, like I say, Columbo's arrival, and he is breaking another egg, just as he did in Stitching Crime. He did. So we assume that they've been happy with the reaction to that, so they're keeping that one in. He yeah, he checks. Well, he's breaking it on a, a mailbox, a post box. Yep. And he checks the, it off. Yeah, yeah. He checks the mailbox. There's nothing, nothing in it, and then a body's removed. That's right. He refuses the opportunity to investigate or look at the body. That's right. And we saw a similar thing 
you actually complained about this, was it just last week's episode, that a body was removed before Columbo mm-hmm. even got there? Yeah. This is one of the, the weaknesses of this episode, and sometimes in general, sometimes the vital clue or the thread that Columbo follows throughout the episode is to be found or has something to do with the body itself. Yeah. So a mark or a feature well, or something. Well, you saw that as far back as Death Lends a Hand, the second episode of the show, when he saw the ring mark on the yes. face. Precisely. It looks like when the clues do not form around the body, the script writers decide that Columbo doesn't need to inspect the body. Yeah, so they skip over it. Yeah, but in episodes where it is vital, you see him, you know, thoroughly check the body and sometimes and you know if, and Yeah, he doesn't have a consistent procedure. Exactly. And that sometimes you know, not looking at the body seems a bit uh, unprofessional. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're leaning towards the whole magic Columbo thing mm-hmm. again where gut instinct tells him before he's seen any evidence exactly what's happened yeah. and what he needs to look at. Either way, he enters the house and there's a, a sergeant there providing exposition. This is an interesting character because we had a really good sidekick for Columbo in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Murray. Who, yes, who we really liked with his classic moustache and he was a great character. Mm-hmm. This week's one is a very different character, much more... I'm not sure how I would put it, but he certainly wants to talk a lot more. This is he John, wants to yeah. insert himself into the investigation. This is John Finnegan. You might not you've come across him a few times already, Ian, but he's a a Columbo regular. Yeah. We've, we've mentioned him. I think his first appearance was as Carol the the Site f- foreman, foreman in, blueprint, yes, for, blueprint for, murder. for murder. So that's who that is. Yeah. But he gives a sort of exposition explaining what happens that the guy is a a, a chemist. Uh, his body was found, the microscope is it looks to be the the murder weapon. Murder yeah. weapon. We actually we see a, an outline, a chalk outline. I don't think it's actually chalk, but of where the body had been lying on the floor. I don't think we've seen that before. No. So that was quite interesting. It's a kind of a. Um, it's a standard. It's almost thing. an iconic thing, you yeah. know, the the body on the ground and then the investigation around it. So I wonder if that's a an image they use for promotion of mm-hmm. the series, Columbo over the chalk outline. I'm just guessing. It might have been the kind of thing they would do. Yeah. Every time I see a, a chalk outline of a body, however, these days I think of uh, Naked Gun and Police Squad. I always think, you know... Subverted that one yeah. quite nicely, didn't they? But uh, the sergeant also mentions that apparently Carol Lessing had two jobs because they found... Well, this is the thing. Slips. The sergeant did this quite a lot. They kind of, without stating that they know for sure, mm-hmm. they are implying that he had a second job or an additional income, a bigger income from somewhere. Mm-hmm. But... I kept thinking he was going to show proof of this, like a bank statement or something, but I think it just comes back down to the scribblings on the... No, he mentions, he says something about the found pay slips and his bank book. Yes, but the, he hasn't had any of this extra money from... Oh, yeah, sure. Um, Lang, yet, yeah. mm-hmm. And the scribblings on the, the notepad are from Vivica mm-hmm. for an offer that hasn't concluded. So there's not like a mass... He doesn't have a huge store of money somewhere. At this mm. point, or any, he's dead now, he won't ever have it. Sure. So, if there's an additional income, it's not anything significant. Columbo notices some broken glass on the floor. Yes. I think there's an assumption that a glass was broken during yeah, the. Yeah, and I think he, he identifies it by by touch. Mm-hmm. It's not he's not necessarily spotted it because it's, it's tiny fragments of yeah. glass. And then Columbo goes into the kitchen. And he's looking for salt for, <laughs> for his, his egg. boiled egg. <laughs> yeah, put the investigation on hold here just a second. Yeah. Guy's dead, he's not going to get dead. Yeah, I think he actually says that he's looking for salt, because, but he usually carries a, a shaker in his pocket. Yes, salt cellar in the pocket. And you'd think that would leak. It would leak. <laughs> Unless it's one of those uh, restaurant ones where you have to turn the... Uh... Even then, you'd still get... You'd have a pocket full of... You know that lint you get yeah. in your pocket? <laughs> it would be, it'd be salted for killing me. Maybe you could fry it up. I don't maybe, know. And your jacket would be awful unbalanced. Maybe he carries pepper on the other one. Yeah, to balance himself out, that would be quite an interesting combination. He's looking around and what he discovers is he finds an empty flower tin, but there is an outline of an octagonal shape on the bottom. Yeah. And, yeah. I, Do we believe that's no. what would happen if you put that in there? I don't. And also, I think this is a fairly unsubtle way of delivering clues. Yeah, and also, if it's flower, as soon as Columbo picks that up, sure, it's going to move. Mm. Yeah, it's very unsubtle. I, I, I don't like how this has just presented itself to Columbo. 
I think they could have found some other way, more intuitive or more realistic yeah. way. And of it's, it's, it's a thread that doesn't really take them anywhere. As I remember, it ends up that particular product is destroyed and he never finds it. Mm-hmm. The sergeant suggests that, and we've, we've heard this a few times before, as this is a hippie area, <laughs> perhaps, the lo- Angeles, yeah. Yeah, perhaps the locals thought that Lessing was producing drugs or perhaps Lessing was producing drugs and that is the, the reason yeah, for the death. perhaps. And again, I think he brings this back to the scribblings on the notepad with the money. Mm-hmm. This is his, his indication that there's more money than the meagre paycheck would suggest. Sure. Um, and then we see the dartboard. With a picture of Vivica on it. Yeah, you think she might have noticed that as a clue when she arrived the night before. <laughs> you see, I was watching this and it was these two sort of very ham-fisted clues we were given straight one after the other. Yes. You know, the the shape been left in the flower tin as if yes. to, you know, there should be an arrow pointing in and saying clue, clue. Yeah. And then the the victim having the killer's picture on the dartboard. I, I hate. Know. I hate this person. It's like almost like Sirhan Sirhan with the RFK diary. I, you know, RFK must die. Yeah. RFK <laughs> must die. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if this is the guy. guy. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's the equivalent, isn't it? Of you know, it never happens in real life. You, you know, someone will have circled something in a newspaper. Yes. That's a clue. They've yes, mapped it around. This is what to look or, at. Or his calendar. It's like yeah. um, you know, day Monday, go to work. Tuesday, yeah. kill Bart. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so these two clues really quite, they were, they were far too obvious and, and ham-fisted. I, I thought they could have done a better job. We've with, talked about the lack of subtlety in the past mm-hmm. and this is taking it to an extreme. Yep. Columbo as well, I see the other thing, Columbo immediately notices this this, this woman's uh, face. because and he recognises her from his wife's beauty products. Yeah, apparently all over the He sees her face bathroom. every time he goes to the toilet. And Sergeant tells Columbo that the, the body was found by some young lad and the boss of this young lad is outside now. I hated this, this conversation. You talked about the boss is outside and goes yeah. like, she's the boss? Is she outside? Mm, no, it's not. Well, what are you doing? Why? Yeah, so what happened is we, we get outside and we find that Lessing had made a number, or, or planned or asked for a number of trips to be arranged for Very him by this trips. travel agent. Yeah. yeah, And it's not a travel agent as we would consider it these days, it was you know it was more of a personal relationship. I suppose you would phone up someone, you would ask them to to arrange these. You wouldn't necessarily Travel agents pay for it. Kind of out of fashion with the advent of the internet. Of course. So when we were younger, I suppose that would be a way for folk to book a holiday. You'd go into the travel agent, they'd book your train tickets, they'd book your ferry crossings, they'd yeah, book your even, hotels. Yeah, but even then, this is not you know we're not talking about you know when we were younger in the, say the eighties. This is the seventies or you know this is ten fifteen years before then. And I think it was even more personal. You wouldn't necessarily gain, you would have a relationship yeah. and you, someone would perhaps arrange a list before you made a payment yeah. to them. So obviously this travel agent is quite suspicious of this person who's come from nowhere, made expensive bookings for which the travel agent has to pay a deposit mm-hmm. um, and then not confirming them by phone on account of being dead. So yeah, so the travel agent sent his underling round to check on him. Yeah, and, before he commits to these payments. Yes, and found the, the body. Yeah. Colombo asks the sergeant to confirm that Lessing only had a few hundred dollars in his bank account. Well, this is the story because the agent says that Carl Lessing was due in that morning with a cheque for three thousand mm-hmm. dollars to pay for this travel, yeah. and the sergeant confirmed that well, he only had three hundred bucks in his bank account. Yeah. And again, there's a discussion about these scribbles, these doodles, on the magazine. Well, no, this is a strange one because this this scene seems to end, and then it kind of cuts to a, a shot of Colombo. The background noise is a bit different. It seems to me like a clear sort of pickup shot. Mm-hmm. They've clearly thought, well, hang on, we didn't explain this very clearly. Yeah. Let's do a one line. And it's a line that doesn't follow from what's just been said. Mm-hmm. It's just, just Columbo musing to himself. Uh, it's a funny kind of pencil to doodle with. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think they've shot it and understood that it wasn't clear enough and they've stuck this scene in. And I think, yeah, it sticks out like a sore thumb and it's a terrible line and it's a terrible add on to that mm-hmm. scene. It doesn't make any sense. But we're back off to the Beauty Mark office and Vivica is overseeing a, a photo shoot and Colombo does one of his tropes. You know, he walks into someone yeah. else's business and distu- <laughs> disrupts what's going on. It reminded me a lot of Requiem uh-huh. for a falling star when he walked into the, the film set. Yes. Um, I'm looking forward in that case then to a fade into murder, right. a future episode where... Okay. Uh, we'll come to that. No. I don't want any spoilers. No, no, shush. sorry. Well, shush. 
Yeah, so, anyway, he, he interrupts, he goes to leave, then he comes back. Oh, it's almost like he fakes to leave mm-hmm. before saying, you know, hang on, you're Vivica, I'm a policeman, let's have a chat. He introdu- yeah, so he introduces himself to her and again, it's that little sort of trope where he <sighs> claims it's an honour. Yeah, it's to, a really awkward her. introduction. Yeah, I've been looking at your face every time I, I've been sitting in the toilet. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so Colombo tells her of the murder and she claims not to have known him very well. Um, she, well, she claims not to know Lessing at all. Well, she's, yes, she said that uh, does does she? No, Colombo notes that Lessing was due to get fired that day by her because yeah, yeah. she almost doesn't she's, like she doesn't recognise the name. He's so, such an underling. He's just not yeah, one of the a, a number. Yep. Um, and then Colombo, this is where we go back to the scene that I missed earlier on. Colombo's identified his personnel file has been put in backwards. The only one in the the cabinet. Yes. So that's a a clue to Colombo immediately. Someone's been looking at this file. It's been out recently. How convenient that she put it in wrong. Well, she, she put it back. Yeah, he asks Vivica who would have access. Yeah. And she says, of course I would have access and dozens of other, other people potentially. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's convenient that, that she made that mistake putting it back. But hey. And then Colombo goes to leave and Vivica does a sort of reverse one more thing and asks to be told if Colombo discovers who this poor boy's murderer was. It's a strange one. Um... Why, why would she care, really? If she doesn't know who he is, he's an underling, I suppose, maybe asking out of courtesy. Mm-hmm. Colombo's concerned as well that he's not been able to get access to the lab. He's tried to get into the lab and been told, no, you're not getting in. Yes, so she insists that she will resolve that. She'll make the calls and he will have free reign. And while she's on the call... No, she's making no, the she call. goes to make the call and yep. she can't get through. Mm-hmm. And Colombo says his goodbyes and he's yep. off. And she goes, to make, she goes to make the call again. Uh, and he kind of sneaks up from behind. And does a one more, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, a ninja one more thing. Yes. <laughs> he, he's still not using that phrase, though. No. We should know that. We're into season three. He's still mm-hmm. not developed that phrase at all. I would say it's not in any way a trope or a catchphrase at this point. No. Um, but this is where he comes back to the, the topic of the pencil, the doodles done with an well, what, pencil. Yeah, well, what he actually says is that it may not be a murderer, it may be a female. Now, that got me thinking. Is so, murderer a gender-specific term? No, not these days. But I'm thinking it must have been a case of a murderer and a murderess. Maybe. Yeah, that's all I could think of. I guess. I, I, I'm not familiar with the word murderous. Even because, historically. Yeah. And he says that he believes this because there was a woman in Lessing's home that night as the doodles were written with a black eyeliner pencil. Yes, and he's told he's wasting his time. Yeah, Bill. He says, that, again, there's a trope here. He says he knows this because it's the type that his wife... With the shopping list. In. Writes a shopping list. Yeah. Very 70s. Is but, it very 70s to write a shopping list? No. The fact that, you know, it was a sort of standard that his wife oh, was right, writing yes. the shopping list, okay, not right. Colombo. With her, no doubt using the household budget that he allocates from his salary. as her stipend. <laughs> but in this case, the the killer has a great response. Yes. So that puts him back in his heels. You enjoyed this one, didn't you? Yeah. And she says that he is wasting his time with her because a brunette would use a black eyeliner pencil, but she's in fact obviously a redhead. Yes, and yeah. you can see that she's not got black eyebrows. So. And yeah, he's stumped because I think he thought he was going down. You know, he was on a yeah, he was going to get somewhere. He was mm-hmm. well, quite often he does these things where he's just kind of prodding and testing and seeing what response he gets, but uh, he gets a response mm-hmm. that he can't do anything but yep. acknowledge. Sure, uh, Vivica Scott. Played by Vera Miles. Born in 1929, still with us. Yeah, it's going to disappoint Carlos greatly that she's still alive. Ooh. <laughs> We're only joking, Carlos. Yes. She was actually groomed to be a Hitchcockian leading lady. Right. But outside factors and things like pregnancy and differences in opinions sort of curtailed that. So she has that sort of. That, that seems like a very sort of cleaned up version of the, the yeah, story. Yeah, I don't think they. Hitchcock and her got on that well. Perhaps a failed relationship or something? Not sure about that. Um, we couldn't possibly imply. We couldn't. But she does have that sort of characteristic, you know, like Kim Novak and Grace Kelly. She was a sort of striking blonde, but not in a, not a sort of Marilyn Monroe giggly girly type way. She was quite... Yeah, quite interesting you mentioned Marilyn Monroe. One mm-hmm. of the things we didn't pick up on last week is that she was an ex of Martin Landau. Ah, yes, I think I... And I, he went out of his way not to be known as... Someone mm-hmm. who had a relationship with Marilyn Monroe. Mm-hmm. So that could be a connection there. Yeah. So Vera Miles, she lost out on a role in Vertigo to Kim Novak. She was, her persona was aided in the development in terms of how she looked. 
Okay. How she dressed by Edith Head. Ah, familiar face. Yeah, from name. Requiem. She yes. was the the world famous, what is it, how many? She had eight or nine Oscars, Oscar, yeah. 25 nominations. So she was involved in sort of creating Vera Mills' persona and look and style. There you go. Most famous for, I suppose, Leila Crane in Psycho. She was in Psycho 2 as well. She. It's not such a well known movie. No, but Psycho 2 is actually a very under appreciated yeah. Yeah, sequel. It okay. was around 20, 25, uh, 22 years after it. Okay. But it's a decent film. Right. She was in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valens, The Wrong Man, The Searchers. So a lot of big movies. Ones that she's a, well appeared of, yeah, yeah, true legend, and she has a, a star on the, the Walk of Fame. There you go. She puts in a very good performance in this episode, we should say as well. She's a touch convincing. Of, yeah, and she has a touch of class about her. Yeah, um, reminiscent maybe of some of our, our previous female killers. Mm-hmm. We go to a chemistry lab within the Beauty Mark offices, and Columbo is speaking to someone. Yeah, there's a guy there, he's destroying all the work from the, the Murchison project. Mm-hmm. You might call him a cleanser. He's he's getting rid of all the... Um, Dreadful, dreadful jokey and stop that, please. I apologise. He, he a... He's wearing a name badge that says Doug. Does it? I didn't notice that. Yeah. But he's not credited as Doug. He's... No, he's credited as a lab attendant. Okay. Columbo wants to find out if he's worked with Lessing, if he knows a bit of his background. He asks about his girlfriends, and we have a clip of the response. Yeah. Do you know if he had any girlfriends? Now, how would I know if he had any girlfriends? I just work here, that's all. I was just thinking, uh, you know, maybe somebody here in the company, because you can't help noticing there's an awful lot of female employees around. Models, Lieutenant. I mean, you don't think they'd be interested in a mere chemist, Howard, do you? Besides, this guy Carl was one of those guys that stuck pretty much to himself. Guy with a lot of ambition, you know what I mean? I guess he figured if you can't bed the mother hen, why waste time with the chickens? There's an implication, I think, in that quote that there was a relationship between Vivica and Carl, and we got mm-hmm. that obviously from their own interaction. But I think that kind of confirms that there was a failed relationship there, mm-hmm. and that Lessing then didn't have any interest in the other girls around the the factory. Yeah. And Doug, the lab attendant, tells Columbo that his job is to get rid of all the the evidence, all the research materials after a project yeah, has taken place. So it doesn't fall into the hands of a competitor. And he explains to Columbo that on this project, everyone got canned. Everyone was fired because it was a, a failure. Yeah, the project didn't go anywhere, so they're, they're all booted out. Yep. And we see him throwing all this material into an incinerator. Yeah, a furnace, I would say. Mm-hmm. And Columbo stops him for a moment because he's seen something he, he wants to examine a little bit, little bit closer. Well, at first he notices that the bottles are unmarked, so he questions you know, how they would know what, what was in what, and he's told that they are coded by colour and by shape. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a clunky exposition mm-hmm. again here, and we find the perfect octagonal base. Yes, and he knows, he recognises that to be the same shape or the same base that he found in the oh, flower yes, container. Yes. There could only possibly be these two things that have that exact shape. Yeah. Columbo's decided this is hard proof that this particular container or one identical to it was in that flower jar. Mm-hmm. Just like we uh, just like we discussed about John Finnegan, the lab attendant was played by Bruce Kirby. Okay. A regular. So we've spoken about him before in the past. We'll speak about him in the future. I think we'll leave that there for, for now. A well Kent face. <laughs> So we get outside, uh, or we're in the, the Beauty Mark off, uh, offices, but we're outside Vivica's internal main office. Yeah, Colombo is looking for Murchison. He's talking to Vivica. And he seems quite impressed by these goings-on in this cosmetics uh, company. Well, I'm not sure whether he's impressed or whether he's, again, prodding. He talks about the, the secrecy and the sort of, you know, almost like they're working against espionage. You know, there seems to be some sort of high-level mm. uh, work going on that he hadn't realised was part of the cosmetics industry. Sure. He is about to leave, but does a one more thing, and he asks Vivica for her help in finding Mur- uh, Murchison. 
as he was working with Lesson on the project that they apparently goofed up. And Vivica tells him he should try the nearest saloon. Obviously it's a, a not a, a well kept secret that he does enjoy the bottle and not just the a, a, a tag yeah, type. Though I suspect she knows he's not in the nearest saloon mm. at this point. Yeah, she doesn't want Columbo speaking to Murchison. Yeah. And Columbo's about to leave and he notices that iconic picture of Vivica hanging on the wall mm-hmm. and he makes a, a crucial observation. Yes, he points out her beauty mark and notices that she does not have that on her at the moment. Yeah, and she gets herself all on a fankle here, trying to think of a cover story, trying to blank him for a mm. moment, then realising she shouldn't blank him, and then just says, oh, I use a black eyebrow pencil. Yeah, she gets herself into a, a bit of a fankle, not, necess- not just because of the question about the beauty mark, because she explains away why she doesn't have it on her face at that point in time. She yeah, says, she's quite assured. She's she got is. a response that she thinks is fine because it's true. Yes, uh, that she doesn't put it on before lunch. And that's why she doesn't have it on yeah, at that moment. Because she thinks that's the that's the thing. He's yeah. trying to say, ah, oh, you have it there, but you don't have it mm-hmm. now. But that's not the question. And she is shocked but when she understands the true implications of the question. Yeah, and, and she feels that she has. To, she tries to cover it, but she has to eventually say because she's going to make herself look worse. But I think mm-hmm. by that point, the damage is done. And Columbo's off at that point. He leaves her standing there to absorb yeah, essentially the he's, ramifications. He's, yeah, he's got the information he wanted. She calls, she enters her office and closes the door and calls uh, the secretary, Shirley, at Lang's office. She puts on a fake voice. Yeah. But she's told that she's not in the office at that point in time. Yeah, she's she's going to keep trying that, that number, but she doesn't get through it. And the time. camera fades out of this scene on... Vivica scratching her finger and perhaps we're led to believe at this point in time that it may be a reaction to the cream itself. Well, we don't yeah, know. We're not, it's not entirely clear. We're not privy to that information. Yeah. We next go to Lang's headquarters and we're under no doubt where we are because Colombo stands under a massive sign declaring it to be David Lang Inc. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no two ways about it. Um, I think yeah, the kind of the the switch here is we've got a, a phone call coming in, mm-hmm. um, and it is Vivica calling for Shirley, but Columbo answers because the phone has been ringing a number of times. Yeah, he explains to Shirley that he took the call because he'd heard it ring, he'd heard it ring, and he wanted to to deal with it. Columbo offers her a cigarette, or offers sorry, offers to light her cigarette. And there's a remark about how much she smokes, and that's important later. So he notices an article on the paper on Shirley's desk about Lessing's death, and he asks if he can borrow it. And he senses that there's an unease about Shirley, and you know she doesn't yeah. seem too happy. Yeah, she's she's a bit shifty because she's been acting mm-hmm. um, badly. But Columbo doesn't know anything about that, and he's not here to speak to her yet. But she's still a little bit, yeah. you know, when faced with the police, a little bit awkward. Yep. So we go through to Lang's office and he states that he did not know or nor had he met Lessing. Uh, he admits that or he suggests that Vivica was an old and dear friend and that he had been in her office but there were thousands of chemists in the industry and he doesn't know uh, why Columbo would be questioning yeah. him. It's a little bit reminiscent of when in Requiem Columbo speaks to Jerry mm-hmm. and he gets the information that he's friends, you know, Yep. With her, with her killer, but really that's not the true situation. So it's a similar sort of re- representation of the relationship here. Sure. Um, Lang suggests that he and Vivica are old dear friends, but they're not. Columbo removes items from his pocket, and this is a, a trope that will be built upon over the years. Yep. And he's looking for something and can't find the, the piece of paper. But yeah. he then confirms that Lessing was found with. Lang's telephone number in, of, for his private line in his wallet. And Lang gets annoyed at this and then attempts to backtrack on the original claim that he didn't know him by saying that as they pay the high salaries in the industry, lots of chemists approach him for work. And Columbo tells him that Lessing was expecting some money. But Lang tells him that he hasn't offered anyone a job for months. Yeah. And I think he kind of uses the cover that um, perhaps Lessing didn't use his own name, mm-hmm. so that would cover why he didn't recognise the name. 
Um, so Shirley kind of comes through at that point because Lang's can summon her. He wants some information. She claims not to recognise the picture or the name. Lang tells her that he may have changed it, but she still claims not to remember anything. And Columbo's watching them and appears to realise that they are playing a bit of a game here. Yeah, I think they're not even playing the same game no. as well. She's trying to protect herself <laughs> and he's trying to protect himself and they're not on the same wavelength yeah. at all. So he asks Lang why uh, Lessing would have used a different name and Lang chuckles at this apparent naivety and explains that Vivica demands devotion from her handsome young employees, again alluding to a, a relationship that was more than purely professional. Or maybe not just with this one person. Sure. And Colombo asks why uh, Lessing would have Lang's private number. And it suggested that he may have simply looked it up just as Colombo did when he was in his office. Yeah, saw it on the phone. I think, yeah, the implication was that the guy came in when Lang wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's a hole there for how would he have got through to the private office to get the private yeah. number. That's maybe something that Shirley then is uncomfortable with, the mm -hmm. suggestion. So Colombo accepts this, but he's obviously not convinced or happy with that that answer and he goes to leave and then we have a, a nice exchange about Columbus confusion with everything related to this the whole industry. nature of the beauty industry yeah sorry I couldn't be of more help well me too sir uh, you see this lesson was up to something I think uh, but this cosmetic stuff is such a complicated thing I mean all this top secret research going on and people spying on other people's products so uh you know, I thought maybe you could give me some clue. If you're questioning the American system of free enterprise, Lieutenant, you've come to the wrong place. Besides, here at Lang, we don't need to bother with that sort of thing. I like that exchange. And Colombo goes to leave, and as he does, we see him, or as he leaves Lang HQ offices, we see him scratching his hand, just like Vivica yeah, the was. Yeah, same way that she had. I wonder whether Columbo's genuinely intrigued by this or whether he thinks it's all a bit silly that they're going to these mm -hmm. lengths over cosmetics. You yeah. know, he, he's shown a sort of a mis misogynist streak in the past mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's the era of male type of beauty <laughs> regime, <laughs> Jerry. No. Oh. So I wonder if perhaps Columbo is um, baffled by why they would go to these lengths over something as simple as cosmetics. Yeah, I don't think Columbo wears aftershave even, does he? Well, I think we had talk about Columbus' smell way back. That <laughs> was it. in Black. We talked about it. Yeah. Um, we think maybe cigar might be his favourite fragrance. <laughs> we go to a clothes shop, and Shirley and Vivi, uh, Vivica are browsing and talking. And Shirley's annoyed that Lang had only offered her a, a ten dollar per week pay rise, and she tells uh, Vivica about Columbus' visit to Lang. And Vivica suggests that maybe Lang killed Lessing. But Shirley seems to think that is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, her reasons for that aren't watertight. No. But I think they come from her having already dismissed it herself. Well, her logic is that it's um, it can't be true because when Lang saw the news article about Lessing's death, he nearly fainted. But, I mean, you know, you, if you were the killer, you might also faint as well when you're reminded of yeah. your dastardly deed. Yeah, I think she's almost worked this backwards. She doesn't think he did it, so she's coming up with reasons rather than yeah. coming to that conclusion from yeah. the information. The other piece of, uh, the other bit of evidence that she has is more compelling. She noticed that the $200,000 that, in a, in a check that he had withdrawn was redeposited back into his own account yeah. after he discovered that Lessing was dead. Now, I think I was confused at first because... The mechanics of this, yeah. Well, I think maybe... It's an American difference, or maybe it's a difference in, in terms of the 70s. Or the language. Of language, this, yeah. yeah. Use of the, the word check. A check, yeah. Perhaps it was a banker's draft or something, something Yeah, else. where the funds were drawn down yeah. to produce the check. Mm -hmm. And he has to represent yeah. that to have them. Because these days, the yeah, a check is nothing leaves the account unless the person receiving it actually cashes it. Certainly for a personal check, yeah. Yeah. So... But that makes sense. If it was a, a banker's draft, that was, yeah, the money was removed to the, the cheque. If he placed it back in his account, it showed that he had the intention of paying him off. Yeah, he wouldn't have taken that money out if he wasn't going to if use it. If he was going Although to kill we him. did have the suggestion earlier on that he might be trying to double-cross him in some way mm -hmm. from Shirley right at the outset. But yeah. certainly, yeah, that seems to imply that he wasn't going to kill him. 
Vivica is clearly nervous as she believes that Shirley knows that she did it. Yeah, and Shirley makes the critical Columbo um, innocent party error of hinting at blackmail. Yes. Now, this reminded me of their Requiem for a Falling Star relationship. So right. she's now the secretary of someone who has murdered someone. And we know how that ended for Jean Davis. It reminded me more all the way back to episode one, the Lila Sanka, mm-hmm. when she made this, sort of, and she didn't want money, she wanted a relationship, but um, Franklin took it in the same way. So it's essentially a blackmail, it's a threat that has to be eliminated. Shirley presses home the, her newfound power by asking her if asking Vivica if she thinks that she could afford a $450 dress. Yeah, this is where the blackmail hints come mm-hmm. in. She's suggesting that some payoff is in order. And she, Vivica says that she has to go as Shirley asks her who she supposes killed Lessing. Again, that's just reaffirming. She's, yeah, laying it on thick here. And Vivica understands the situation. Understands yep. the, the, the blackmail under a current critical strategic error and arranges to meet Shirley at a farm where, yes. they, where they had apparently met before. Yeah. So we go to this farm and we discover that it's actually a fat farm. You know, I think before we go there, do we not go back to the lab at Beauty Mark briefly? Yeah, you're right, we do. Very, it's normally me that misses scenes. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Uh, yes, and we see Vivica putting something into some cigarettes. She's tampering with it. She pl- places crystals into a cigarette. Yeah, I assumed it was poison of yes, some kind. That's exactly what what it was. It's certainly the alternative was it was a short fuse situation where it was going to blow up. <laughs> sort of hilarious yeah. Tom and Jerry style blackened face <laughs> would result. And the hair, like <laughs> Einstein. Yes. Uh, I think, yeah, there was one of the Harry Potter movies you got that the guy tried to spell, he blew up his own yeah. face. Yeah. And in fact, you're, well, the reason why I hadn't missed that was because that is the lab at the Fat Farm. Ah, so it's connected. Yes. So she's that, because, we know that because she hears the car horn as she's doing this, and she looks out and she sees that it's Columbo yes. arrived at this farm, this Fat Farm. There's These... some sort of training going on outside, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, but the fat you just couldn't call it. You wouldn't call it a fat farm these days. And it's talk, not very sensitive, is it? No, they talk about reductions. I'm assuming that's just fat reduction. Yeah, it's, it's yes. Yeah. So yeah, a, a fat farm, and we see all these people in uniform, the uh, gym gear, doing these exercises, and they're up on the roof. It reminded me of a Bruce Lee movie. So we have this uh, a training mansion where you've got guards up on the uh, up up on the roof, and you've got right. all these people practicing to defend the. You know, the head bad guy. That's what it looked like to me. <laughs> yeah, okay. So Columbo looks on in amazement as he scratches his hand as uh, when, when when Vivica appears. I'm not sure Columbo's entirely certain of what this place is. No, he, he isn't. And we have a double trope here which, you know, which highlights that. Because he's told us a fat farm and he comments that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, gee. But his wife is a little problem like that and could do with the help. But he's then shocked to find out it costs $200 per day. So we've got the whole mention, mentioning the wife and then misogyny. Be, misogyny and being shocked at, at the cost of things. Oh yeah, it's a triple one, triple, triple strike. One. Vivica tells uh, Columbo that she's very busy, she wants to get rid of him, but he's determined to tag along. Yeah, and I think it's because she knows she's about to meet Shirley. Shirley here, mm. So she's trying to get rid she's of Columbo. She's very anxious here, yes. And it's almost like the reverse of what we saw in the most dangerous match when Columbo was trying lots of different ways mm-hmm. um, to get Emmett to come with him. This mm-hmm. is her trying lots of different ways to get Columbo to leave her alone. Yeah. Because she goes through a, a, a few different opportunities here. Until we get or they arrive at, she opens a door and Columbo turns around in, in, in horror. Yes, yeah, it's Columbo's kryptonite, the, the naked female form. <laughs> and at this point, Vivica says, ah, I, I know you're looking for Murchison... You'll find him in the building. And he leaves her to meet with Shirley as he goes to speak to Murchison. Yeah. A brief scene on the sort of beachfront. She deliberately knocks Shirley's bag out of her hand. And when she picks it up, she firstly inserts a note into it. See, I, I assume that was some kind of paper wallet full of cigarettes, but... That seemed to me... I'm, I'm trying to remember. This seemed to be a sort of missing... This wasn't picked up on. She put something in there. Yeah, I wonder if it's connected to 
the imminent death? Is it a suicide note or a, we, did, we, we, should, we needed more of an explanation. Some kind of recover. Who knows? But she puts something in there, and she also leaves or removes her cigarettes, which we know she's partial to. Yeah. And we go to a massage area within <laughs> this fat farm. Yeah, and Murchison is just yelling random things. It's all a bit odd. Yeah, he's been roughly mas- uh, massaged by uh, the, the, this woman. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, pressure points that release. It's almost like yeah. a sort of physical yeah. implementation of Tourette's. He's crying out for his kidneys and this and that. Yeah. And he's obviously not enjoying it. No, I don't think he is. And another masseuse notices Colombo and asks him to strip. Yeah, they, they assume he's there for a treatment. Yeah, before he IDs himself. And then there's a weird scene as Colombo says he doesn't understand why Murchison is still there as he thought that Vivica was really angry with him and the whole project team were yeah. fired. Murchison says, the goddess of beauty never changes. She is what she is. It's almost like a brainwashing. Yeah. He's like some kind of cultist mm-hmm. where he just follows her cult and whatever she says is acceptable to him. But Columbo seems satisfied by this response. Sure, I think he understands mm-hmm. the situation. I don't think that he can get much more from Murchison. The rough masseuse, did you recognise her? No, I, I, I didn't. The wonderful Anne Ramsey. She died, unfortunately, in 1988, aged 58. Oh dear. Uh, but she's most famous for playing Mama Fratelli in The Goonies. Ah... Uh... And also from the mother in Throw Mama from the Train with Billy Crystal. Right. And Danny DeVito. This great movie. I'm trying to think, was that one with Kate Mulgrew? Yes, it was. Yes. That, that was, that was, uh. Mrs. Colombo. Mrs. Colombo. Ah, <laughs> tying things in, yes. Kate Mulgrew played the ex estranged wife of Billy Crystal. We're going to get so much hate mail for even mentioning Mrs. Colombo. Shouldn't mention it. The comments are going to blow up. <laughs> it's not canon! But yes, that was one of uh, Anne Ramsey's uh, first first roles. There you go. The blonde uh, masseuse. She was played by Diane Travis. And she has been in six, or will be in six episodes of Columbo. Okay. The first one was credited as the blonde in the road in Requiem for a Falling Star. So outside the bar where the cars were switched, maybe? M- must have been, yeah. That's only road scene, or when she was running down. Possibly. Um, Jerry there, yeah. Yep. So we go back now to the beachfront. Um, yeah, you get another bizarre comment. It's, it's like Shirley's joining the cult as well. She wants to be just like Vivica. Yeah. And she asks for a, an executive job within Beauty Mark. Yeah, and, and Vivica, with her plan in place, is quite happy just to kind of go along. Yeah. And Shirley can't find her cigarettes. Obviously, because they're lying in the road where she dropped her bag. Yeah, so Vivica gives her one that uh, she has with her. Conveniently. Mm-hmm. And Shirley thanks Vivica with a kiss and a hug. She's and overjoyed, she's, yeah. yeah. You say it's one of these things where it does seem like a, 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 a cultish brainwashing. Yes, it's, yes, they're following this icon. Yeah, and she claims, and this is the thing that she'd never say, she claims that she won't tell anyone anything. <laughs> and that, Vivica's thinking, no, you won't. Yeah, you won't indeed. <laughs> so Shirley leaves in her car and she's smoking her cigarette. And we're back to the fat farm. Yeah, Columbo's, Columbo's waiting yeah, for Vivica to return. Yeah, and he, he starts clearing his throat. And he's been doing this mm. through the episode. It's quite irritating. I, I don't know if it's a symptom of poison ivy or mm. if it's just that he has it as a tick or if he's trying to... He does it almost deliberately. Mm-hmm. It's like a technique. Sure. He stops and clears his throat and it's when he's in the middle of saying something important, mm-hmm. quite often or when he's about to say something crucial. And I wonder if there's a, a sort of an investigatory reason for it, but Maybe. I'm not sure yet. Maybe with future episodes I'll clear it up. And he mentions to her that he thinks something was stolen from Lessing, but Vivica has absolutely no time for his theories and she tells him that He's taken up enough of her time already, yeah. and she gets up to leave. And we're back to Shirley in her car. Yeah, and we're getting one of these crazy scenes with the the technique, the camera technique. Yeah, the back. Uh, what you yeah. call it? Uh, it's a first person point of back view. projection type. Yeah, thing. yeah. But it kind of blurs. It starts to kind of you, start, you just get a hint of it at mm-hmm. first. And we see her driving in her car, and she's becoming faint as a cliff approaches. Yeah, in in front. Um, Conveniently, yeah. 
We'll speak about that in a moment. Okay. Back to the fat farm. And Vivica yes. is instructing some people and um, not too impressive manner. She's saying things like, try harder and jump up and down faster. Yes. Or, Be thinner. Yeah. So Colombo comes out and she calls him very stubborn. Yeah, uh, yeah. she she calls Colombo stubborn because he won't leave her alone, essentially. And, yeah, and she asks if he thinks that she could possibly have been involved in Lessing's death. And then Colombo tells her about the dartboard, the yep. picture of her in it, and she seems quite upset. And she starts scratching her hands, mm-hmm. and it's almost implied that it's a stress thing, but it's not. We know it's not, and we're about to be told it's yeah. not. We've a couple of scenes time. But here's another really weird, <laughs> weird scene. So after she's in shock about this uh, revelation of the dartboard picture, yeah. and Colombo tells her that it is common. And that he has had fantasies about strangling a captain that he didn't get along with, and he puts his hands up to his throat like that. It's really quite a weird, uh, funny but odd, odd scene. Yeah, and again, I think it's it's Columbo just experimenting with approaches mm-hmm. to try and get the information. He's obviously aware that she's yeah. not want to speak to him. And Vivica is outraged and tells him that he belongs in a museum, and she storms off, scratching her hand. Yes, he belongs in a museum. That was um, I. I didn't quite get that quote down earlier, but I, I remember she said something like that. She's outraged with him. We go to Shirley's car, and we see Shirley lose control, and she crashes her car. Now, this is, again, not something I'm happy with. Yeah, and we talked about it briefly a moment ago. It's very convenient that she would lose control at that moment. There's no way that, the, uh, that Vivica could be certain this would cause her to die. If I was feeling faint or unwell whilst I was driving... As soon as I started to feel feel unwell, I would stop the car. You pull over. Mm-hmm. The only thing maybe in her favour is that perhaps that it was a fairly fast acting poison, and she was going to die anyway. Right. So maybe the car crash just fortunately covered it up, mm-hmm. and perhaps that ties into the note that we don't know anything about. But yeah. But the other thing as well is surely any sort of autopsy would reveal. That it you know, there was poison in her. We just don't know because we don't know what it was that she was given. We don't know how it worked. Maybe it was a dissolving suture. Maybe it was... You know, not not literally a dissolving suture, <laughs> but, you know, a, a thing that would not be evident when they checked for it. Mm-hmm. We go back to the courtyard of the fat farm and Columbus pondering how the killer got into Lessing's home. And he says that maybe it was an, a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend who had a key but why would they be interested in this red jar? Yeah. And Vivica seems interested in, in, in this questioning. Yeah, he's finally hooked her. Mm. And Columbo explains that the jar in the flower tin was from the research project and suggests that Lessing knew more about the project than what he was letting on. Yeah, this is where he makes the assertion that nothing else could possibly have had that size or shape of mm. face. Yeah. And Columbo says he, an, uh, he has another question. And he wants to clear up a rumour. Did she date Lessing? And she confirms that she did. <laughs> I like this. Okay, on you go. This is almost like the the yeah. flip of the, the anticipated relationship between a boss and like a, maybe a male boss mm-hmm. who would date a series of female employees. It reminded me of what was the one in the... Oh, um, you think of Short Fuse? No, it wasn't Short Fuse, it was the Greenhouse Jungle. It was Tony Goodland's A Strange Oh, right, Life. you're talking about the attitude to men. Yes, right. where she says you know, she's quite open and honest about it, that she had other relationships, and you know, probably not the typical attitude of yeah, uh, the 70s. Yeah, I suppose to an extent this is what we talked about, in, again, in the most dangerous match, about the show kind of hinting at being self-aware, mm-hmm. almost retrospectively. Um, Columbo's very male oriented attitudes are you know identified and reflected upon within the yeah. show but what she actually says is she confirms that she did date him years ago hundreds of minutes hundreds of sins and she likes young men yes and she doesn't care if that offends Columbo's traditional Columbo. masculine outlook we did see obviously in that one in the greenhouse jungle that Columbo very much respected that mm-hmm. approach so perhaps the same applies yeah. here so Columbo apologises and he leaves, but returns to ask about uh, what poison ivy looks like, as he has an itch and his nephew, Trope, who is a dermatologist, says that that's what it is. Although a cop from the lab <laughs> told him that it's not found in California. It's very drawn out and he went back to his nephew. He confirmed it definitely is that. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I think that she starts to feel a bit of pressure here because without any... She blurts out, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, without any kind of pressure at all being applied, she's confessing, or not confessing, but denying... She killed killing someone somebody. without an, accusa- yeah, an accusation. Yeah, she was never accused and she just kind of comes out with it. So, yeah, I think the, the heat is building for her here. Yeah, she says she could not kill a fly, which is a reference, a nod to Psycho. Right. We go back to the Beauty Mark headquarters. Yes, we're away from the fat farm and back in the, the big smoke. Like, yeah, again, Columbo's waiting on Viving as she arrives. Yeah, there's a couple of times this episode now we've seen him waiting for her arriving. He has a newspaper and he says he's there to apologise for upsetting her yesterday. Yeah, he's not really there to apologise no. for upsetting her. And he shows her the newspaper article detailing Shirley's death. Yeah, we learned Shirley's surname at last. She's Shirley Blaine. Mm-hmm. And Vivica says that she was pretty, and it was sad that she she was it was sad, but she only had met her once, and it was the other day at the catwalk show. Ah, is this where we find out what that note was? She had in her possession a copy of the cheque that Lang had mm. written out for Lessing, or under the name Smith. Yes, that must be what it was. Yep. Good point. That well worked out, Ian. Yeah. Um, yes, Columbo points that out, and that comes back to a couple more questions, doesn't it? Well, firstly, he tells uh, Vivica that Shirley's pupils were dilated, and that could mean that drugs or poison <laughs> uh, were, were involved. Yeah, or an exploding cigar. I don't know. Columbo yeah. always seems to know exactly what it was yeah. without the doctors being able to identify it. And he then says he's found out recently that poisons are used in uh, the cosmetics industry. But Vivica says that this is not the case anymore. He's backing up the wrong Maybe thinking of botulism. Yes. Columbo also explains that they found with Lang... No, with Shirley. Yes. That he'd withdrawn a, a withdrawn and then redeposited this check. Yeah, we talked about that briefly back when Shirley was talking to Vivica. But mm. this Columbo getting that information now, so he's processing that mm. within the context of the whole situation. And then Vivica pretends to innocently reveal that Lang was a chemist. You know that doesn't mean that he would have used this knowledge in any nefarious way. But Columbo claims that this information may actually help him and he leaves the office. But he does a one more thing and he tells her it was poison ivy. Uh, this, is, this is a really convenient way. Yeah, Lessing had the only poison ivy in Southern California. Apparently. Yeah, it's so unbelievable. Yeah. We'll get to the, the sort of weakness of the conclusion, but yeah, he says that he had poison ivy extract. Yeah. In his house for some chemical experiments. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's licensed and he's the only license for it in Southern yeah. California, perhaps. That would make sense. Mm-hmm. So Columbo says he must have touched uh, a, a jar of it somewhere and he's going to send round the lab guys to find out like where it was. But why? Yeah. Why does this matter? At this stage, why is he telling Vivica? Well, we've talked about this before where he shows evidence to suspects mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It's the same sort of thing. Now, the reason he's telling I assume is to see what her reaction is. Of course. It's always what he's trying to do. But there can be no, if she was innocent, there's no, you'd be thinking, sorry, you're going to try and find out if there was poison ivy. What's that got to do with anything? Yeah. Um, Interestingly, I got this wrong here, but we know that her hand is also itchy. Mm -hmm. My assumption was that ivy must be in the product, Mm. and that's the connection, which probably would have been better than what it actually is, to be honest. Sure. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway Columbo apologises again and he shakes her hand as he leaves and he notices that she's wearing gloves and yeah this is yeah, she, he also says he's noticed her scratching her hand yeah. so after she leaves you see Vivica again scratching her hand and opens the safe containing the cream and she remembers rubbing this on her hand earlier so again yeah, as you were that's mentioning that's where I got that idea yeah, she probably assumed that's where she was get, getting it from I guess yeah she came to the same conclusion I did yeah. so she takes the cream out and she leaves her office Yep. And we're back to the fat farm. Yeah, the, the Vivica Scott um, slimming camp. Yep. And she speaks with Murchison and asks if he is able to analyse a sample of something but to keep it uh, sort of under the radar. Yeah, so she's trying to find out, is there poison ivy in this? Yes. But then, this confused me because surely Murchison was involved in the production of this product all along. Hmm. But then maybe she thinks this is the secret ingredient... Yeah, and he maybe been cut out of it by lacing. That yeah. would make sense. Yes, but I suspect she's kind of guessing to a certain extent. So Vivica goes to her lab in order to take to take a small sample of this 
scream for Murchison, but she hears the car horns and she looks out of her window to discover two police cars have pulled up in the courtyard. Yeah. Not Columbo at this point. No, 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 but no doubt he's about. Yeah, and then she panics. <laughs> yeah, she throws the jar out the window into the scene. Yeah, and a hugely long distance. There's no way that that was a proper throw, especially the way she threw it from a, a small window. And the, you wouldn't get yeah the, the distance would not be right. Yeah, there's no chance she's throwing that. No way. But anyway, it's dramatized. Yeah. It's for dramatic effect on television. The cops arrive at the door of her her room. Yeah. And they tell her they have a court order to search the place. That's it. And she puts on some sort of faux outrage and asks why they want to, to search the place and suggests that they may be looking for a red tub with an octagonal bottom or shape on it. Yeah, because Columbus talked to her about yeah. it previously. And she seems confident because she's disposed of this already. Yeah, they won't find that. Columbo then arrives and he is ignoring Vivica's demand to know how long things will take. And he puts a briefcase or a sort of bag on the table. And then, I'm not sure if this is a plain words or not, but he then claims it is the damnedest case he has ever known. Is that a deliberate plain words? He says, ah, this is the damnedest case as he places a case down on the table. Or perhaps, am I reading perhaps. too much into that? Yeah, no, no, I think that's probably probably going with a play on words, but I think that we would criticise him as we have criticised one another for yeah. terrible plays on words. <laughs> He, tell- he certainly has a flair for the, the dramatic flourish, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. I think almost to the detriment of his work on a number of occasions, particularly in a stitch in crime. We talked last week that he would probably lose his conviction because of his display he's at been, the end of the episode. He's been pulled up a few times by his boss, the, uh, the not, captain. It's it's the combo, next time you've got the clothes, just let us know as soon yeah. as you've got it. Do not... Ah, but, but boss, boss, I need... It's a big reveal. <laughs> this, no. this is my favourite bit, <laughs> boss. No. Get the evidence marked. Make sure it's all done by the book. And just arrest them. Arrest yeah. them in silence. <laughs> but no, no, he's got. He's setting himself up where he's setting the scene up for a big yeah. finale. And he tells the other cops in the room that he's discovered where the poison ivy was at Lessing's house. Um, there was a drawer of a locked filing cabinet, a place that Columbo had never touched himself. Columbo then mentions that he noticed uh, Vivica had been wearing gloves and scratching her hand recently. She insists that even if she had uh, poison ivy, it has nothing to do with Lessing and she never touched this jar. Yeah, which is reasonable. Mm -hmm. She's still assuming that the poison ivy was in the formula. And Columbo then bluntly tells her that she's under arrest for murder and asks the other cops to step out of the room. Yeah, because I assumed that he was going to make some connection with her talking about a serum that he'd mm-hmm. never mentioned before. Yeah. But, no, this kind of gets brushed away. I'm not sure well. why he asks the other cops to leave the room. Well, for his big dramatic finish. Well, surely you would like an audience no, for that. No, I think it's a private moment. A private all Columbo cares about is that the killer knows he's got them. That's just, it. Just, he, as, just as well, that's all he cares about, because if <laughs> convictions were his, his thing, he'd be no, so no, disappointed. I, I don't think that's his job, uh, or at least that's not how he sees his own job. So Columbo lifts the microscope from this briefcase that he brought and said that it had bothered him from the start, Yeah, that something wasn't right. Yeah, and let, let's have a listen to how he presents it to her. Where there's a microscope, there's always a smile. You see, we got our poison ivy in the same place. We both touched the slide. You touched it when you picked up the microscope and hit him. That's when the slide broke. I got it when I put my hand on the floor and it touched a piece of glass. I remember because I said, fellas, it feels like there's broken glass here. fingerprint man, he thought the glass came from a drinking glass. Wow. Very good, Lieutenant. Officer? I think we're both just about old enough to remember family holiday slides. Yeah, just about. Just about. Perhaps an older relative would have them. <laughs> not not our parents' generation, but the one before. Yeah. Um, but yes, Columbo is going back to the brother-in-law trope. 
Yeah, this. Uh, so she seems to accept this when it's been when uh, Columbo reveals it, and it's one of these yeah um, premature crumblings. It's an incredibly weak ending. This actually, I'm not. This is I said at the start. This is well, season three is where Columbo really sort of kicks on. This feels like a hangover from the earlier ep- uh, the earlier seasons. This yeah. is a, quite a weak episode. That this clue itself was a nonsense. All she had to do was deny it. What's happened here is he has said that he received the poison ivy when he picked up this broken glass from the slide. Yep. And she must have uh, touched the slide when she picked up the microscope to kill him. All she has to do is say, no, that's not what happened. I didn't kill yeah. anyone. I wasn't I've, not, I've not itched my hand yep. the whole time. What are you talking about? Yeah. No. <laughs> she, she, she can have poison ivy, but that's, there's no, there's yeah, no, she does or not, there's yeah. no proof at all. Uh, yeah, I noted it's unsatisfactory. What's your favourite quote here about proof, Ian? Give me it. Yeah, I think what we should do is we should get this queued up um, from the most dangerous match. Okay, every time well, we get to the end of the episode. Right, well, uh, in fact, yeah. using the magic of time travel, I'm going to do it right now. Will you give me proof, Lieutenant? Where is your proof, Lieutenant? Where is the proof indeed? None. None whatsoever. Not by any common or garden definition of proof anyway. Yeah. There's not even really a circumstantial case here. No, we can't place her at the scene, unless you're going to believe that. I mean, the poison ivy is the thing that places her at the scene. Mm-hmm. They don't have the octagonal thing. Yeah, they don't have anything else at all to they've place got, her there. They've got nothing here. The phone call to the police can't have happened, or they would have mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that really irked me about this episode is they've slipped back into that habit of not giving us enough of the information. Yeah, you can't hide things. The so. poison ivy thing. They kind of they were hinting at it, but they didn't give us enough at the start to let an educated or intelligent viewer find work out what mm-hmm. the conclusion is. And you, you almost want that. I know, I know a lot of the enjoyment even, of seeing yeah. Columbo work it out. Well, it's not even working it out. It's it's yeah. We, yeah. we need to understand what has happened, and it's yeah. As you say, as it's Columbo work, watching Columbo do this. But we don't watching see reaction. Him work it out. We don't. We don't. We don't see it. We just yeah. get told at the yeah. end. Here's what happened. Yeah. And. What what's all the more baffling about this is that we saw the scene at the start where they did go back and give mm-hmm. extra information, and they went back and gave extra information about something else. Yeah, not the ivy. No, I agree. Uh, it's a, a, a poor ending. Not a dreadful episode. It's not dreadful. There was nice touches. It was enjoyable, but in comparison to the last two episodes we've had, uh, double shock and the stitching crime, this doesn't hold up very well. No, I, I would agree with that. But I did like um, Vivica Scott as a good character. Mm-hmm. I think. Um, the story let her down a little bit because she could have been a really good one and I think that she was played well I think she carried herself nicely Mm -hmm. and I think she was a good bad guy I mean she was a good killer she was but I think if you were listing all the Columbo killers so far she would Mm -hmm. be higher up than the episode would be if you listed all the episodes so far I think that's maybe a fair assessment Mm. just before the episode finally uh, the credits finally roll she has a nice little touch where she well what is it she says yeah, she she tells uh, Columbo to take a message back to his brother-in-law, yeah. uh, but she leaves it up to Columbo to, to define the specific message. Yeah, one that's appropriate. She's obviously <laughs> disgusted with him. Yes, yes, she feels like that's that's the reason that she has um, been found out. So, that, yeah, that's us. I think our, our views are, are probably fairly Similar. clear on this. That's actually, going back to that last point, it's one of a number of very close similarities to Requiem. Mm-hmm. It's almost like they've taken the same basic story and just kind of made it worse. The specifics. Well, no, yeah, but there's a lot of things that are very, very, very similar between the two episodes. Both have the same sort of carriage of women as the killer. There's a lot of the relationship things: yeah. Columbo and his wife knowing, even, giving even, him information. Even the roles you've got, a, you know, a high-powered woman, and you've got the female secretary. Yeah. Who then says to get involved and in, gets killed for black, oh, not yeah. blackmailing, but yeah, yeah. potential re- revealing mm-hmm. of information. You've got rivals, a male rival. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we talked earlier in this episode about the way that he, the male rival then redefines their relationship when talking to the police. Yeah, we've got the brother-in-law being the critical piece of evidence to mm-hmm. solving the crime. It's you've got Colombo being very well aware of the the, the killer for yep. a number of years and quite honoured. Yep, and again, yeah, with the wife being the connection mm-hmm. there again. So I, I would say there are a number of striking similarities between these two episodes. And I wonder if we might find that there's is there a, a writer connection between the two? The writer 
was Jackson Gillis, who did indeed write Requiem for a Falling Star. So well done in that, Ian. There you go. Maybe a little bit lazy then by him. Maybe this was a... He'd other things on. Um, I wonder if he wrote them both at the same time, almost. Or like, wrote one and then kind of had ideas for the other one and, and came back and said, mm-hmm. look, you've got another episode. Just on that, season three saw Jackson Gillis effectively work himself out of Columbo. Okay. So he moved on to other projects. He came back. He, came, he comes back a few times in future seasons. Yeah. But he is looking now to do other things. Yeah, I think if you look at the show notes for it, might actually be the show notes for Requiem, or possibly one of the other episodes he worked on at the end of season two. I went into a bit of detail about the awards that he won, mm-hmm. and it was more for his early work in Columbo yep. than later on. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's understandable. I think his early work was stronger. Roland Kibbe took his place alongside Dean Hargrove, and they oversaw the the, uh, the, the Hedy of the show. Perhaps? Yes, they did. We have Gino Swarch. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. That was the the director. Yeah. Born in 1939 in Paris, famous for Jaws 2, Supergirl. Recently, he. Directed a lot of episodes of Bones, Grey's Anatomy, Smallville, Jag. Back in the 70s, he had Kojak and The Rockford Files, Beretta, and 1985's Santa Claus with Dudley Mill. I like that film. Yeah, good movie. A lot of folk don't, but I, I, it's actually one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a movie that I've seen comes up on the <laughs> podcast. That's a, a shocker. Did I mention the lab being the same? You didn't, but did yes, not. it looks familiar to people who yeah. have seen the stitching crime. So the lab, yeah, uh, at... Beauty Mark was the same set used uh, for the observation theatre yep. in the Stitch and Crime that Columbo peered down from. There you go. And a couple of other things. David Toma, he played a bit part here as a, a cop. I'm not sure which cop in this episode. Sure. But in real life, he was an ex narcotics cop who got into movies. All right. But he had a show named after him called Toma in the 70s. Ran from 73 to 74, and there was 22 episodes. And I think in each episode he had a, not a cameo, but he played an extra in it. So this, ah, th- this guy was given his like own... Stan Lee in the Marvel movies. Yeah, just like Stan Lee. <laughs> My, uh, Martin Sheen worked previously a number of times with uh, Lincoln Levison. Okay. And was a big fan of their style and their work, so he jumped at the opportunity to work in Columbo. Big fan of the show before that. That's why he took such a a small role on, on Columbo. For such a big star. Yeah. And one of the other reasons was that he was desperate to work with Vincent Price. We've not mentioned Vincent Price yet. We've not. I think you'd best squeeze that in before the end of the show. Oh, I think we should. I'd be outraged if we didn't. Uh, I'm sure there would from the folk who know who he is. Oh, dearie me, Ian. Vincent Price is an absolute legend, a horror legend. So he's probably the American equivalent of Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing. From the Hammer Horror. Yeah, thing. is that... That type. He he died in 1993, aged 82. He famously played roles in The House of Wax, The Original Fly, Theatre of Blood. Fairly recently, though, the 80s, they Dead Heat, and then he was in Edward Scissorhands. I've heard of Edward Scissorhands. I've mm-hmm. seen bits of that. He was also a notable gourmet and, and chef, and in the mid-70s, basically dedicated his time and resources to being a uh, a TV uh, cook presenter. Like we saw last week. Yes. Uh, with uh, pa- uh, Dexter Paris. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that nice was. Connection. <laughs> yeah. Price is a, an absolute legend in the uh, horror industry. Oh, there you go. Theatre of Blood, that's my favourite. Right. House yeah. of Wax was. Um, no. Later remade. No, not, not the Paris Hilton one, was it? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it's a remake or they stole the title. I don't know, I've not, I've not seen the... Uh, I, I actually have seen the Paris Hilton one, me. believe it or not. It's quite creepy and yeah. I, I, I have a vivid memory of someone getting a finger cut off mm. from putting their hand through a, a grate. I reckon that's one of two Paris Hilton movies you've seen. Um, now, uh, I, I next week, about, next so. week, we are off to uh, one of everyone's personal favourites. Any old port in a storm. What do you think that's about, Ian? Well, I'm wondering if we're going to be revisiting our list of things that make Columbo queasy. Ah, you think? Uh, I'm only guessing. Oh, okay. And that's a classic episode. Beloved by many. Of course, it's a phrase with uh, multiple meanings. It certainly is. So we'll have fun looking at 
more wordplay next <laughs> week. Yeah. Uh, Anything else you want to say, Ian, before we before we wrap this up? This no, no, week? I'm looking forward. I'm very excited about what's to come because I've heard so many good things and I hope that the episodes live up to it and I'm sure they will. They will. I think we should say thank you to everyone again who has been downloading the show, who has been listening, who has been interacting with us on social media, on the, the website. We do yep. appreciate it. ColumboPodcast.com. been some great conversations. Yep. We're adding new people every week. So Glad to see Largo back. Largo always writes a, a, yeah, a, a lengthy tome. piece of um, thought yes. about the episode and it's great and it helps stimulate conversation. But like I'm saying, there's been new folk coming in. There's always new folks. So don't mm-hmm. feel intimidated. It's not cliquey in any way. Just jump in and chat about Colombo. We're all keen to meet mm-hmm. new people and to talk about the shows with them. I should thank again the folk who have, there's been a few this week going on to iTunes to rate the show in particular. Also, reviews are great. Um, it makes a big difference because the more people that do that, the greater the exposure the show gets so we get a bigger audience and that that helps in many ways okay i think that's us for this week in thanks again to everyone and we shall see you all next week cheerio you have been listening to the colombo podcast from herd yet media